Father, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you are enthroned on the praises of the people. So we know today that you're right here in the midst of us as we lift your name up, as we praise you, as we glorify you, as we pour our hearts out to you, Father. We love you so much. We love you and thank you for being in our midst. about uh, all of our community groups and our connect groups and you know if you've just been longing um, for friendships or connection that's a great way to do it y'all and also on Wednesday nights we have um, the healing and prophetic rooms going on and we started last week and it was a great success you know we get right back into it we have worship and prayer in here we have kids um, um, and youth starting and Tanner and Lindsay told me um, that they had 20 kids last Wednesday. And so, I mean, that's exciting. And they were so excited about it, too. Had a, had a great time. Um, so anyway, um, I think what's that? I don't think there's any other announcements. So I'm just going to go right into our Hope um, devotional. And it is, He Restores My Soul. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my, he, res, uh, he leads me beside the still waters and restores my soul. Okay, I'm so sorry, I don't have this on my paper and that's kind of hard for me to see. I think I can do this. <laughs> in Psalm 23, we find a wonderful picture of God as our shepherd. Sheep have a problem becoming trapped on their back, unable to get back to their feet. This is known as being cast. It often happens when the sheep is resting and rolls just a little too far to one side. Powerless to get back to its feet, the sheep becomes even more desirable to predators looking for an easy meal. Because of the sheep's anatomy, gases begin to build into the sheep, inside the sheep and it will die in hours on a hot day unless the shepherd restores the sheep to its feet. We are a lot like sheep. When we have a massive moral failing or life just knocks us on our backs, we feel helpless. We can feel like everyone has abandoned us. We can sense the vultures circling overhead. Luckily, we have a perfect shepherd who is faithful to restore life back to us. It would be hard to picture a shepherd finding his cast sheep and then beating the sheep for failing and berating the sheep for its weakness. No, shepherds know their sheep are weak, yet still love and care for them in their weakness. Mm. Shepherds' livelihoods depend on healthy, happy sheep. How much more does our perfect shepherd who paid the greatest, I'm sorry, y'all, the greatest of prices for his flock seek to restore us when we are cast down? We often think God is mad at us, that he is repulsed by our weakness, or that we deserve what comes to us. Sometimes we do. But God doesn't see us that way. God knows our weakness. He knows that we are prone to sin and death. Yet even still, he chooses to sacrifice himself to purchase us. He is faithful to restore us, not only to our feet, but to the flock and to himself. 
no matter how many times we are cast down, our hope is assured in our perfect shepherd. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you see me where I am, that you love me where I am, that I am of great value to you, and that you paid a terrible price for me. Thank you for being faithful despite my unfaithfulness. Thank you for restoring my soul, for restoring life to me when only when I only see death. Thank you, Lord. What a great God we have. So, Pastor Lindell. just want to say a prayer for you. Oh, I didn't do the offering. So, yeah, we can do that as I pray for Lyndall. Um, ushers come forward, and then we take uh, cards in the back, and you can go to the front and pay. You can pay online. Not pay, give. Sorry, y'all. Give online. So, anyway, I'm used to working in a dental office, you know. So, Lord, I just want to lift up Lyndall to you this morning and, and pray that the words that you've given him will come out so clearly, Father, and that you will just be with him and uh, uh, just bless him, God, as he shares, as he brings um, what the Lord has shared with him. Thank you, Lord. It's funny when she said that. I mean, it reminds me. I, I know it's in prayer, but it reminded me of the movie Major Pain. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> so, Lord, help me understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, continue to give. Um, anyway, uh, glad you're here. It's good to see everybody. Uh, last week, we talked about giving and, and, and the heart. And since there was, you know, very little heckling and even less throwing of objects up here, I decided to continue uh, the subject this week, sort of. So we'll see if, it, if I can go two weeks without getting hit. Really, though, I, I just want to talk about Philippians 4. Most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Philippians 4. It's a pretty uh, common chapter in the Bible. But there's two sets of verses in this chapter that, that I believe are somewhat a continuation of last week. Uh, but also, I think they're just great words to live by. Um, understanding and believing Philippians 4 will give us a chance to really grow and, and thrive in the world. So um, most of you are familiar with verse, chapter 4, verse 6, about uh, being anxious for nothing. And 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, right? Everybody knows those. But there's so much more in this book, y'all. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he's thanking them for supporting him, and he's encouraging them in the work that they're doing, and he's encouraging them to be faithful. So I want to start with... Uh, Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's go back to verse 4. This is just really simple. It tells us to rejoice in the Lord. See how I interpreted that? <laughs> rejoice in the Lord. Be glad. Take delight in the Lord every day. Every day. It's so simple. Sometimes I think we forget this. This verse doesn't imply that everything's perfect. He just says twice that we should rejoice. What's so hard about that? We just need to rejoice. Wake up every day and tell the Lord that today is the day. Agree with the Lord. Agree with him that he has made this day and that you're going to make a decision to rejoice in this day. We get to make that decision every day and we're going to be glad in it. And then just find something to make you smile. If, if you can't think of anything, when you get out of bed in the morning, think of me. And see, that'll bring a smile to most of your faces. Or find something else. Now, being who I am, I also created a bumper sticker while I was preparing this lesson. A stupid bumper sticker. Smiles give you miles. Frowns make you drown. It's the truth. Put a smile on your heart and you'll live a lot longer than if you live with a frown on your face and in your spirit. Smiles will give you miles. Frowns will help you drown. Anyway. Verse 5. 
says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So how do you make your gentleness be known to man? Well, first you have to make sure you have gentleness, right? You can't make it known to man if you don't have any. So if you don't know how, just ask someone. Probably speaking to the guys more than the girls here. Or start out by taking delight in the Lord from the verse before. That's what you can do. Take delight in the Lord, but let your... Find your gentleness. And I do want to speak to the men. I don't want you to mistake gentleness for weakness. Sometimes we do that. Gentleness is not weakness. It's just be kind. Don't be mean. Don't be cruel. Don't be rough. That goes for some of you women too. But, and, and look, it goes for me too, I know. Most of you know me, so I can't like pass off a bunch of stuff because you know me. So I know that this applies to me as well. The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? I don't know what it means super spiritually. To me, it just means the Lord is here. It just means the Lord is with me. He is always around me. And if you can accept that, that the Lord is within reach, he's in your bubble, I think it will help. Verse 6, to my amazement, this verse has seemed to stir up trouble. Uh, over the years. I think some people misread what it means. So I'm just going to lay this scripture out for you. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. No thing. Be anxious for nothing. See, where the trouble begins sometimes is people want to say, or some people want to say, Yeah, but you have to do this. But that doesn't mean you don't prepare. It doesn't mean you don't plan. It doesn't mean that you don't do this, 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 and this. Okay. Do those things. But it means what it means. It means don't be anxious for anything. We have to be aware. Yes, we have to do those things. You know what the definition of anxiety is? Being full of mental distress or uneasiness because of fear of danger or misfortune. Don't be that. It's okay to care about your world. It's okay to care about what you have to do, but don't let anxiety or being anxious control what you do. God's really clear about that. But those are just the first four words. Once we get past anxiety, it also reads, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Well, we all know what prayer is, but what is supplication? I even had to look that one up. I've read this verse a thousand times. All it is is a different kind of prayer. It's humble prayer, humble prayer. In case my, watch, my mom's watching, humble prayer, mom. And petition. In every situation, good and bad, pray with humility. Be thankful. Share your requests with God. He already knows your checklist, right? He already knows everything about you. So just share it with him. Have a talk with him. Communicate with him. Be kind. Be humble. Be thankful. And let him know what you're thinking. I think, I just want to say this is is simple stuff. Don't overthink it. I'm not speak for you, but for me, sometimes I read the Bible and I look at these things and I think, oh my God, what's the depth? What is the inner meaning? And a lot of times there is deeper meaning in stuff. But sometimes it just means what it means. Just don't be anxious. In everything, by prayer and petition, in in humble prayer, with thanksgiving in your heart, let your requests be made known to God. Let's don't make it any more difficult. Verse 7. If we do the things we just read in verses 4 through 6, then verse 7 says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace and contentment will come. I think Catherine was mentioned that in her last song. The opposite of anxiety is peace. This is one of our life goals. It's one of mine. I hope it's one of yours because the Lord talks a lot about peace. So God brings peace when we rejoice. He brings peace when we're gentle. When we let him have our anxiety, when we pray, and when we're thankful. I want to talk about surpassing our understanding. 
And I really today, I want you to understand. I sound more like preaching. And I don't really mean to like, Ugh! I want you to understand the enormity of this statement. In fact, in fact, as I say, we actually have no capacity to understand this statement. We do not have enough capacity in our bodies and in our minds to understand how big the peace of God is. There is no grid for us to know the amount of understanding. So if you can understand that you can't understand, then you can begin to understand how big God is. You got it? There's your bumper sticker right there. That wasn't even in my notes. That was a good one. Somebody put a check mark on that one. But it's the truth. We have to understand, accept and believe, understand, accept and believe that he is bigger than our box. This peace, all the things of God, this peace, all the things of God, they are larger than anything our minds have the capacity to consider. Now, we all think we have pretty good minds. I mean, I think I do. I, I can't even touch an infinitesimal point of the understanding or the bigness of God. We just can't. This is larger than anything we can think, experience, understand, fill in your blank. We can't even have the discussion that I'm having because we don't know how to understand all of the things out there of Him. But if we do verses 4 through 6, then that amount of peace, that amount of peace that we can't understand, it will guard our hearts and our minds. So I don't have to know the number. I don't know, have to know the bigness to know, but that's a lot. That it will guard my heart and my mind. That peace will protect us more than we could ever imagine. Just think about it. More than you can imagine. More than you have the capacity to understand. That's how much peace you can have. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that's more than 100%. But what will this peace protect you from? Everything. It protects you from everything. Fear, worrying about finances, your children, the things that have happened to you in the past, the things that you've done in the past, temptation, pain. This list as as long as you want it to be. Your list is your list, and that's how long it is. And it's done through the blood of Christ Jesus. Folks, this is, this is a huge thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Folks, this is a huge thing for thriving in the world. I sound like Bobby Brady for a minute, didn't I? Remember, you know, when he was going through the... That's the Brady one. Never mind. Sorry. Back up. Focus. This is huge key for thriving in the world. So I really encourage you... When you go home sometime in the next week, look over these verses again. Sit down when you're not in a church service and ask the Lord how big, how important this scripture is. Do it again and again until you believe it. Not here. Here. Believe it here. That's when it'll have an effect in your life. This won't have an effect in your life. This will. So let's go to Philippians 4, 9 through 19. I'm also going to read those. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, 
well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let's go back to through these verses as well. Verse 9. I'm going to read it again. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, the Philippian people, the church at Philippi, obviously bought into to Paul's teachings, right? Because what he was doing, because they're supporting him financially and through prayer. So they obviously bought into his ministry. So then we're going to continue with peace. If you want the God of peace in your life, do what godly people do. Not religious people. Do what godly people do. Or read Philippians 4 above and do that. Verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. I I like what Paul does in this set of scriptures. You see, where he says he rejoiced in the Lord. Go back to verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul did it. He rejoiced in the Lord always. Paul's a godly person. He rejoices in the Lord. We should rejoice in the Lord. Do what godly people do. This particular rejoice is because he recognizes that they are giving, they are helping him again. This isn't the first time. Whatever's happening at the church in Philippi, they understood that Paul had needs, and they sowed into his ministry again and again and again. They are giving, they're helping him. The people at Philippi, I already said that, they get it. Paul knew that they cared, and he knew that they now have more opportunity. They're growing in this opportunity. Now, this is my interpretation of what happened, that the people sowed into his ministry and they learned something, and the Lord touched them, and they chose to continue sowing into his ministry. Let's go to verse 11 and 12. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. After encouraging them in verse 10, Now Paul's teaching them using his experience. He says, don't depend on help. Trust the Lord. Sounds a lot like Proverbs 3, right? Trust the Lord. Depend on what the Lord says. Doesn't mean friends and people can't help you, but trust God. Be okay no matter what's going on. That's your life in general. Just be okay. Paul has experienced all levels of things in his life. So he knows, right? I'm going to say, I'm going to guess that Paul has experienced way worse things in life than I have. And if Paul can say this, then I probably can too. Because I think he has experience that I don't have. So no matter what's going on in your life, find a way to be content. It doesn't mean it just happens. Find it. Go find out how to be content. And it's right here in the scripture we're reading. So, Don't be anxious. Enjoy the Lord's peace. You know, this doesn't mean that we we don't try to better our lives. That's not what being content means. It doesn't mean that you just sit still and don't do anything in your life. don't, Don't hear me say that. But we can be content and not anxious while we're still living life. Paul says he knows how to be abased and how to abound. Well, we pretty much know what abound means, but Everybody ever wonder what abased means? It's kind of a funny word. It basically means that we've been brought down to earth, maybe slightly humbled or degraded. What a funny choice of words, to be slightly humbled or slightly degraded. Anybody that's ever been degraded felt that it was slight? No, I I don't think it was slight, but that's what being abased is. So we're all going to experience both of those in our lives. We are. You don't get out alive with having, without having both of these happen in your life. Sometimes abasing more than abounding, it seems like. But I'm just saying, it's okay, right? Hakuna Matata. That's what it is. Hakuna Matata. No worries. Take it easy. Take it easy. I don't even know what movie that's from. 
From what? Oh, sorry. Okay. At this point, I, I, do, I do realize some of you know me very well, and you're suggesting that I take my own advice. And I will. I have. While, I'm, while I've been preparing this week, I, I know I can become a few adjectives. So I do, I do hear what I'm reading. You know, I struggle with this sometimes, but I struggle in application, not in agreement. I believe it. I agree with it. I just don't always apply it. So that's my deal is first you have to believe it, then you have to apply it. So whether you're full or hungry, now that's physically, spiritually, or emotionally, abounding or abasing, you can still have peace. You have to know. Again, it's like last week, I just kept hounding. You have to believe. If you don't believe you can have peace, then you won't. You first have to believe before you can uh, uh, grab a hold of it. Verse, th verse 13. This is the great one, right? This is the big one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is one of my favorite verses too. But, I mean, obviously... Most of us in this room are not going to be astronauts or pro athletes or whatever your dream was, right? So there's no sarcasm here. This is not about things you can't obtain or attain. I wanted to be a pro athlete for a formerly great team called the Dallas Cowboys when I was a kid. It didn't take long to figure out that I didn't have the abilities, okay? It wasn't about faith. It wasn't about, well, God says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There are realities of life. I get that. But this is totally a faith verse. If you're going to be successful in all that Christ has called you to be, you have to believe this verse. You have to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can do Anything Christ asks you to do. That's my belief. That's my teaching. You can believe what you want, but I believe you cannot be all you're called to be until you believe that you can do anything through Christ. It's about believing Him. Everything's on the table. Everything. To me, this is even more than faith on a mustard seed of a mustard seed. It's understanding that truly, truly, I can do whatever God wants me to do because He created me for it. And he will be with me all the way. But you have to believe it way down deep. Every time I went to Mexico on a, on a mission trip, I believed God was going to let me speak Spanish in through my English voice and that they were going to hear me. You know what happened in Acts, right? I believe that. I believe that I can do that. It hasn't happened yet to my knowledge. So that's just one of the, the, the examples in my life. We all have things we have to believe way down deep that whatever he calls us to do, we can do. Because you'll never take that step of faith, will you? You'll never take that step of faith to do something if you don't believe that God has put in you the ability to do it. Would you remind me of that in the second one? Because that's not in my notes either. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have Becky jump up and say, insert here, Lyndall. <laughs> Verses 14 through 16. Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Once again, Paul thanks the church. See what he's doing here? He's thankful. He's encouraging. He's thankful. He's encouraging. He's, this is what he's doing to the church. So somehow I've got to figure out how to thank you and encourage you in the midst of all this. <laughs> Sounds a lot like I'm just screaming. But he is grateful that they took care of his needs when the people in other towns wouldn't, when other churches wouldn't. Paul is grateful. He recognized that they took care of him when others wouldn't. They understand what he's doing, and they've committed to helping him even when he's not ministering to him, even when he's helping someone else. They're sowing into his ministry. God took care of Paul using these people. And it tells me that God will take care of us too, no matter where we are. No matter where we are.
God will take care of all of our needs. Verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. This is a cool one too. I love this verse. I didn't know I loved it till this week. He needs them. Paul needs them to help with his physical needs. But he is way more excited about seeing the benefit they received from the Lord because of their giving. He needs what they have. But that's not what excites him. What excites him is because of their faith to give into his ministry, they get blessed. That's what's exciting. They help him and the Lord blesses them. Everybody wins. It's the way it is. Verse 18, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent. Did I already read that? The things sent from you. A sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. Paul again lets them know that he's grateful for their help and he's content. Paul, with all the things going on in his life, is content. I look at it as extreme contentment from Paul, his own version, like of Hakuna Matata. Verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A final encouragement. Paul is reinforcing that God will take care of them just as he has taken care of him. This is something we can bank on. Just like he took care of them, he will take care of us. He will take care of you. I want to encourage you one more time. God sees you when you're up, and he sees you when you're down, when you're full and when you're empty, just like Paul in the church at Philippi. You do your part, and God will do his part. And I want to close with a story. I called this sermon, Let Go and Let God, because my mom suggested it. <laughs> I was visiting with her this week and told her I was going to talk, probably talk on Philippians 4 and and she said, well, you should call it Let Go and Let God. I was like, well, I didn't say anything, actually. I just kind of looked the other way. But I thought about it. And then, then before I left, she says, hey, by the way, I put an envelope. She's got this little mail slot hanging in her apartment by the door. And every, I have a slot, and my sister has a slot. And so when we come to visit her, stuff she wants us to take home, she puts in our slot. She said, I put an envelope in your slot. I want, you to, I want you to have. It's something I want you to have. And I know y'all can't see this, but it's a cross with a clip on the back, and it says, let go and let God. She had already put that, she had already put that in, in an envelope, and it was sealed. And she said, I think you should call your sermon Let Go and Let God. So I took this, started praying about it. But then she, well, before I did that, she told me the story about this cross, Back in 1997, my parents were trying to decide uh, whether they were going to retire from Cal Farley's Boys Ranch. They loved helping kids, but they also knew that at some point the, the, it was nearing an end. Their ministry was nearing an end. Um, it was a decision that they, uh, she said they struggled with quite a bit, and which seems odd to, about my parents because... I never saw them struggling with anything like that. And so I saw them, she said they struggled quite a bit. Was this the right time? It's what they kept asking themselves. Is this the right time? I remember my dad one time telling me that, he said, son, we'll stay out here as long as we're helping children. Because I was telling him to retire. And he said, no, we'll stay as long as we're helping children. And uh, so they just couldn't figure out what was the right time. They were just uneasy. So one evening... On the weekends, they would go to their home in Canyon, and one evening they were walking around their neighborhood, and Dad saw this laying on the ground, just laying out in the street. And he bent over and picked it up, and she said he really wasn't sure. I mean, obviously he can read, he can see it's a cross, but uh, he picked it up, but he, he really wasn't sure what it was other than the object it was. After discussing it, my parents discussed it, and they decided that they should let go of their anxiety about the decision that they, had to be, that they had to make and just trust the Lord to speak to them. This cross, found in a street during an uneasy time, the Lord spoke to them and said, just let it go. Let it go and let me, 
Trust me to tell you what to do. So they did. They agreed to lay it down and quit worrying about it. And very soon they got their answer. In August 1997, they retired after 42 years. So, ministry team, would you come up? Let go and let God. Be content. Have peace. Trust him. Go back and read these scriptures again. But I want to, come, I want to encourage you to come get prayer. Maybe you struggle with being anxious. Maybe it's trusting the Lord. Maybe you need peace. Maybe you want to be more gentle. Maybe you need help rejoicing. Maybe you need help learning to give. Maybe you need help learning how to be content. Maybe you need help learning how to be grateful. Just come get prayer for this or any other reason. Father, we thank you that we can, we can read your word and we can learn what you think about us, how you encourage us, how you speak to us, how we can trust you. We thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit, Lord, that speaks inside of each one of us. And I just ask your Holy Spirit to just come and envelop every person here and every person watching, that you speak to their, the deepest part of their spirit, Lord, and that every one of them will receive what they need to receive today. And they will trust and they will believe and they will have peace and they will be content. And I just pray for their faith to come out to do whatever it is you put in them to do. We call forth that faith that's needed to do that right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all have a great week, okay?